Hi folks, a customer sent this in and said, we need help. The tool paths here are way too long, something like three or four hours for the total operation. How do I get that cycle time down? So let's poke around and see what we can learn. Welcome to the Fusion Friday. Uh, so aside from this being a really cool part, this sort of thing might be one of my favorite things out there. I love d diving in. Uh, I am gonna ask a favor. We have created an idea in the idea station because what I would like the Fusion team to do is when you go to machining time, um, this shows me the two hours and four minutes for all of the operations in the setup. I have been requesting for a year to give me a list of each operation and the respective time because I so often find, I wanna find which is the longest one. And for instance, let's say I mistakenly missed a decimal in a drilling feed rate. There may be a spot drill and something like this that's taking an hour or 20 minutes because of a decimal. I don't wanna to have to right click in each one. So if you don't mind folks, go upvote that. Okay, so right click on these each one at a time and let's look at how long they take. So 12 minutes for the face. Four minutes for the 2D contour, 51 minutes for the pocket, 54 for the parallel, and 52 seconds for this last 2D contour. So the good news is these two are almost, almost probably 90% of the time. So I would generally say let's focus on those. Um, the problem with this video is, you know, it's so dependent on the machine you've got. Um, is your goal cycle time or is your goal surface finish, the work holding, the rigidity? So, you know, we can't give you a definite answer, but I think there's some good tricks. Um, one thing I would mention on the facing is, and we'll just see if this happens any faster. One, two, three, four. We've got four step downs. A quarter inch tool. And we're doing uh, almost full step overs. So what I would say, we'll see if it's any faster, is reduce uh, the multiple depths and let's just take a 25% step over times 0.25. And let's just see if that's any faster from a cycle time. As a general rule, I would rather cut deeper and thinner. Yeah, a minute better. Um, so that's just a general rule of thumb because you know what? I bought this tool, I paid for the shank length. Um, when you cut thinner, you have a better chip that forms in the gullet, better chip evacuation. So I would probably make that improvement. Again, it's probably a little material dependent, but a good thing to tackle. So this pocket operation, which was 51 minutes. The first thing I notice is look at all the red plunges, the red spirals. These are a time suck. Now, don't get me wrong, they are great. And plunging into material with most end mills is generally not a great thing to do. But that doesn't mean we should accept these red things for what they are and how they're modeled. Uh, first of all, if this were being done in wood or plastic, I probably would consider a plunge. Now, I would like to know how much time those red things take. And if we look, so 5136, remember that. So the ramp feed rate is 12 inches a minute. You'll notice that's about a third of the feed rate itself. And under the linking tab, we're two degree ramp angle, that's pretty shallow, and ramp clearance height. Uh, so there's a lot we can play with here, but to figure out how much time is being sucked away by the red ramping, let's just switch to a plunge and We'll leave it at 12 inches a minute, so it's still gonna take some time, but it's gonna be a lot faster to plunge straight down than it is to do all that two degree helical ramp. 32 minutes. So at least we know almost half, about 20 minutes of that operation was just the red ramping. So let's go back to it. We'll go into Helix, but let's improve it. So again, depending on the material and depending on the grind of your end mill, which if you don't know what that means or you don't know the type of end mill you've got, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, or, or that's you, There are end mills you can buy that can Helix in at steeper angles, but I probably wouldn't mind. I think this customer was wood or plastic. I probably wouldn't mind going to a five degree ramp angle. Ramp clearance height, 
0.02. It's not really where you save them a lot of time. And we're going to change the feed rate on the ramp to 30. So click OK. Thirty-four minutes. Look at that. Now, don't get too focused on the time because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here is make a good part, not to break tools, not to rip pieces out of the workpiece. So I've always said it's much better to start conservative, start with something that works on the machine, and then come back and dial it in a little bit more. Much easier to do that than start with something that tears the part out or ruins, uh, gouges in. Um, so it's fun to get carried away with making improvements when you're sitting behind being a keyboard hero, uh, but just keep that in mind. But hey, still, I don't think, you know, let's look at a compromise. Let's keep, let's back the ramp clearance height back to 30 thou, and let's go to a four degree. I am pretty sure this would be fine. Click OK. Still 35 minutes. Uh, I want to make sure nothing happened. If we go back to two... I think that was our set settings before. Something's wrong. Oh, that's right. I forgot uh, ramp feed rate. Go back to 12. This should change it back to the 51. Yeah, 52 minutes. So I love spot checking like this. I love getting to this super analytical mode of trying to rebuild scenarios and make sure you didn't miss something. So the improvements we made to get it down were ramp feed rate 30 inches a minute and that was the big improvement so let's just say with a four degree angle really that should be fine and 30 thou ramp heel uh, ramp clearance height and we should be back in like the 33 34 range 35 that's fine it's 15 minutes quicker so this parallel let's take a look at this looks beautiful There's no real lead in to speak of. So really, a lot of this probably comes down to step over. Uh, the first thing I would probably do is, you know, looking at this, there aren't too many tight uh, inside radius type things. So the best thing to do would probably be to switch to a quarter inch or three eighth inch uh, ball end mill. I think, I could be wrong, that we can get into all of the areas uh, with that larger tool. And the benefit is with the larger uh, diameter ball, you're actually gonna be able to do a bigger step over and have less scalloping, so better even resolution. Let's look though, I noticed he had feed optimization turned on. This is a really cool thing where you'll slow down uh, the feed rate of the machine. Uh, the idea was to, when you're going into like a corner here because if we take a look at the simulation everything should be roughed out as we're coming into the parallel so let's take a look. I don't like what I'm seeing here because um, we've got all this, we've got the stock incorrectly defined. But what I meant thinking is I don't really see a reason why I need to be slowing down. Um, now that we're looking at this sim though, let's go back to the pocket, which is effectively, um, you know, to be honest, I probably would not use a pocket here. Pocket does not embrace the beautiful adaptive strategy within HSM or Fusion 360 CAM. So I would do a 3D adaptive, again, over the pocket strategy because it's gonna take into account a constant uh, chip load or width of cut to maintain, to, you know, to not exceed it, but also to maximize your cut. Well, heck, let's just set it up. So 2D pocket, um, or excuse me, 3D, adaptive with this one tool number 102. So I'll duplicate this JWS side A. Actually we'll call it NYC CNC side A. Delete this guy. 
3D adaptive clearing. Got that tool. Uh, let's see here. We wanted to do the faster 30 inch ramp. Optimal load, that's so it's a 0.125 inch tool. I'll just say 0.125 times 0.25. Uh, leave five thou. See what we get. Oops. Do rest machining from previous operations to make sure it takes into account the. Actually, we need to move this here. The face and the contour. Now, one downside is the adaptive is going to take a lot longer to compute because. It's this smart strategy. It's iterating through to understand what direction to move the cutter to max to cut as much material as I can, but not too much to violate these settings. All right, made some changes to this adaptive uh, to get the cycle time down. We were doing 200% uh, of the tool diameter as the maximum step down. I think I'd be okay with that because we're only doing 25% of the di uh, uh, width of cut. It's a 1 inch tool though, so I might be pushing it there. Uh, definitely potentially pushing it in certain steels and aluminums. Uh, probably fine in wood and plastic. We went to pretty much the same ramp uh, diameter and uh, the same feeds and speeds. So I'm getting this error here, which is a super common error. Uh, I would like the Fusion team to fix this because the nomenclature doesn't make sense. There is no such thing as the retract plane, to safe plane. Uh, I think there was some answer for it, but, you know, uh, when I look at my heights, I don't see, it doesn't make any sense. So I think the answer was just to bump it up to, I think one of these just needed to be 0.1. There's some, like, hidden minimum dimension in there, but I wanted to uh, let you guys know I much prefer to have my cam error-free because if you leave a little error like that in there, uh, it's probably innocuous but or harmless, but you know, if you have a real error pop up, then you become numb to the little yellow flags. So let's take a look. So we're at 40 minutes. Um, definitely lost some time, five minutes. However, I would much prefer to have an adaptive strategy here. To me, that's just so important. And if I really wanted to shave the time off, we need to make sure it would work. But one of the things that I noticed was, look, it's spiraling down right here when I could enter from the side of the part. So let's just take a look. You'll notice my geometry, I constrained it to this green uh, section, which is the profile of the part. And it's not letting me do anything more than tool center on boundary. So let's say instead we do tool outside of boundary. This will let the tool extend just outside of this green line by its full diameter. But let's add in like another 0.05. And let's see if that'll let it enter and plunge straight down instead of uh, ramping in with the helix. Awesome. Look, first of all, just look how much nicer that looks. We're ramping in the side. I think that's great. Did we do any better on machining time? Yeah, four mi uh, three minutes, three minutes, uh, 36.50. So not bad. Uh, one of the things I would probably consider trying was the increasing the plunge feed rate. Here's the thing. Plunging, so far as I know, doesn't distinguish between plunging in air and plunging into material. Now, linking moves in yellow uh, should be moving at a rapid feed rate, but most, I don't, well, here, let's just try it. Um, it's okay. Let's plunge it 100 inches a minute. Actually, let me look at my time again. 36.50. So, of course, we're not going to plunge at 150 inches a minute, but let's just see, does it change the time? Okay, done. 36.50, the exact same time. So the good news is, I just confirmed, there's really no plunging going on here. So putting it at 12 is fine, won't hurt anything. Uh, and if for some reason some plunging snuck back in, uh, obviously we don't want to be going 150 inches a minute. Last improvement I would make is if somebody really wanted us to, to you know, cook with, uh, cook with gas on this thing, Get rid of this 1 8 inch square shouldered end mill. Switch to a 3 16 or quarter inch bull nose. So that's a tool that has a slightly radius uh, side. Like this guy right here. That's going to do a couple things. 
uh, it's going to most importantly in this part with all of these sweeping features, it's going to let it more closely rough in. That way when we hop over to this parallel where we want the least amount of tool deflection, so you don't want as you vary load, uh, it's going to induce some amount of varying tool pressure. I don't care uh, how you know what material it is or what machine you've got on, it just is. When you look at these hard stair steps that we're about to see, so a bull nose would do a better job blending those in, which gets better more material in the adaptive strategies, and a bigger tool is going to definitely be the best way to reduce this cycle time. So on this parallel, yeah, I'm not sure what I've got to add. Where are we at on time? 54.39. It's probably just a step over. Let's take a look. We double this step over times 2. In theory, it should have our time. Hmm, not quite having the time. Now, one of the things that's a, a problem with the parallel strategy is it's not taking a constant step down. So a better strategy might actually be the ramp strategy, I believe. This strategy, if you read the hover of window, ramps down walls rather than machines with a constant Z. So I think it's going to do a better job of hugging the material. This has more to do with the quality of the finished part than it does improving the cycle time. Um, but what I will say on the cycle time is if you've got most of the material removed with an adaptive strategy, uh, I would cut at a faster feed rate than two thousandths per tooth because two thousandths per tooth, I believe, assumes that you've got something like 30 or 50 percent of the cutter engaged in the cut, and I won't bore you with crazy technical details on feeds and speeds and cutting geometries, but we're only cutting something like a five thou left after this. Now, there is, if we don't use a bullnose, you're going to have those stair steps, so it is going <clears> to <throat> bring it in a little bit more, but basically, you're cutting way thinner than that at the as an end result, and so you're going to rub. It's actually a bad thing to do. Uh, somebody pop chime in, in the comments below if there's a better way to think about effective um, feed per tooth when you're doing this. Um, the other thing that I would mention is counterintuitive to, or it's counterproductive in terms of cycle times, but I'm a big fan. If we've done this adaptive here with the square shoulder, hit control D, it duplicates it. Now switch the tool to that 101, which is our ball end mill. Make sure we've got rest machining turned on. Click OK. And this is going to do an adaptive strategy with the ball end mill. And what that's going to do is it's going to get rid of all of the surprises, all of those big changes in geometry left over from that quarter inch uh, or whatever it was. Yeah, quarter inch square shouldered tool here. That way, when we hop into this parallel, we could fly. I've done on our Tormach 440, I've done work at 100 inches a minute easy. But you don't want to do that if you're going to have the tool bouncing between really thin cuts and, and again hitting big chunks of material. Good news is that's done. Bad news is it took about three minutes to calculate. Adaptives with rest machining definitely take some time. It's a 13 minute tool path. You know, this is up to you guys, but boy, what I would rather do is that I, I would almost insist on this. And then let's go back to our parallel and let's go. You know, if we were at 100 inches a minute, that's only 5,000 per tooth. I would even consider going faster. It depends on what your machine can handle. 40 and 40 on this. And remember, this operation was closer to 54 minutes. So keeping the same step over, we're down to over. Oh my God, we're down to 12 minutes. That is a win. Absolute win. So I'm going to call that a wrap, but hopefully that gives you guys some good tips and tricks on how to use the machine time. Uh, to your advantage, to change settings, track improvements, uh, and get some speeds and feeds and cutting recipes dialed in. Take care, folks. See you next Friday.